right. I'd like to welcome Canella Michelle Myers, the beautiful Canella Michelle Myers from White Rock, BC, Canada. Uh, that is correct. White Rock. That's right. Yeah. 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 Uh, Canella is a an awakened teacher who shares uh, primarily through satsang. Uh, I'll let you take over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I share. Um, I call it like satsang, uh, self realization and embodiment. So it's uh, in particular making use of what appears to be the human aspect in the play of existence. Uh, and how that can lead us right into selfhood um, once explored. Mm. Yeah, I, I felt like you would be uh, a perfect fit for these interviews because I guess it's been almost 20 years now since we've hung out, has it? Or I, I believe so, yeah. That, yeah. yeah. So, uh, but I do remember your, your style of sharing is very much uh, about honoring people's processes and it's not very um cut and dry you know with you with what you see in some non-dual teachings mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so i really appreciate that about you and and your teaching and uh yeah it's really good to see you again after all these years yeah it's good to see you too <clears throat> kyle i uh, yeah i've been like this all the way through nothing new for me to include the human aspect <laughs> uh and yeah. i'm really glad though that a lot more of the world has uh you know not making the human aspect smaller you know right yeah as if, as if smaller yeah well there's enough isolation going around so i think uh it's very timely what we're doing here so yeah so i guess uh i'll just start off with a little spiritual dis disclaimer uh we're uh, we're gonna dive into the personal story that is kind of contrary and a little bit to the teachings of non-duality because um non-duality tends to focus on uh the absence of division and obviously focusing on the story kind of creates that dualistic play but uh, nonetheless, this is the human experience, and uh, that's how we ended up here and why we're talking. So it obviously is very important to honor that. And um, and also just I think it helps uh, people to relate more to, you know, folks like you and I uh, so that we don't seem all high and mighty uh, or just normal people who failed miserably at life and <laughs> <laughs> over and over <laughs> over and over yeah. yeah and continue to fail and succeed in the most wonderful way so uh mm -hmm. why don't we start with uh going way back uh to your earliest memory in this lifetime can you share um Uh, I don't know if that's the best place to start. Maybe just uh, the earliest pivotal memory that you have in your upbringing. I'll let you pick one that you feel is appropriate mm. to start with. Mm. That uh -huh. kind of started. That started to shape. Mm. Canella. Pretty, yeah. Well, being born. <laughs> so you, you do, you, <laughs> now uh, this is you, more or less looking at uh you know through the exploration of who i am as a human being um i've come to know myself more and more deeply and because the moment is not exclusive to the one we're in in other words we have access to all moments in any moment um i recognize a lot of the human aspect and the play of myself does have to do with not being in anyone's knowledge until the moment I has, was actually born. Um, there was no preconceived idea of a baby, another baby. There was going to be supposed to be one and uh, you're, it you're, threw everything. 
your mother uh, believed that there was just one big baby boy. Is that correct? The doctors, everyone. Everybody. Had, yeah. At a four-year-old, a two-year-old. And then they were expecting one more uh, baby boy when the doctor listened. Uh, you know, in the old way, of course, they didn't have ultrasound and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they did, but it wasn't available to uh, you know, I don't Most know people, yeah. Yeah, uh, they heard one heartbeat. So uh, according to everyone looking back at the information, nobody knew because our heartbeats were beating simultaneously. Um, but the factual part of my brother being born and then five minutes later, I was born, his twin sister, um, that rocked the family. Uh, and through in, things in what way out, would you say it rocked the family they weren't prepared for two uh, newborn i mean ultimately you cannot be prepared for twins <laughs> you would know right and then and then well i don't have twins but i do have uh they were 16 months apart two oh boys. okay i was sorry uh, so i thought they were you know, twins no, yeah no yeah they look you've met them i think yeah, yeah. yeah and they, they a lot of people imagine that they might be twins but no they're 16 months apart which is close. So I, I get the idea what the potential like of having newborn twins would be. Um, and so it, it, it threw the things out of balance even more, apparently in, uh, in a way it was like, uh, and, and I wasn't, they didn't want an extra baby. Um, so. Uh, and you have memories of, of feeling that uh, from them. Uh, absolutely yeah absolutely even uh i remember in satsang once my, my mother my mother came to satsang when i uh was offering satsang in white rock years ago um the uh, host and hostess uh you know they loved having my mom come somebody would go and pick her up and i'd come from north vancouver and um i was supporting people by by saying you know look um uh, you need to be who you are exactly as you are for your children because they picked you to make the mistakes, make the right moves. They picked you from a soul's perspective to be who you are because they're looking from a soul perspective in, in what they're uh, moving as consciousness in, in this lifetime. And uh, so uh, I, I said, it's okay. You can relax. You're not supposed to be a certain way as a mother or a father, uh, your children picked you. And my mom, who was in, she said right away, well, why in the world did you pick us? We didn't want you. <laughs> you know, it's like everybody went a little quiet. And I said, well, yes, I, I know. <laughs> I know that. And uh, Was that remark coming from a little bit of anger in her or was she just kind of... She was surprised. To, she was just saying just something matter-of-factly that it was true um, that they, they didn't want me. Uh, right. And so I was more or less, a, a, you know, seemed to be felt as a burden, um, which, you know, affected me. Um, and I, I don't feel that anymore, right? Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. But it, it was a pivotal thing, plus yeah. being a twin to a boy, and he was treated very differently than I was, even though in my just being part of existence and... and the felt sense of us, uh, my twin brother and I, is that we are the same mm. in so many ways. Uh, we could feel each other, you know, mental telepathy, all this sort of stuff that's just twin yeah. stuff. Um, total gift, by the way. Uh, I love it. And uh, yet they treated him so differently, you know, and I never really, I just couldn't figure out what the heck. Uh, and it was because I was a girl and he was a boy. Mm. And so the girl boy part also was very much a part of uh, my awareness and my uh, being in the world. So, um, you know, bringing balance to the masculine feminine aspect in myself, it, it just makes sense uh, that that would be part of my journey. I can see how, um, how being a twin in that way, coupled with the parental rejection must have made it all the more painful in that environment as you were trying to get a sense of your place, you know? Well, I was left at the hospital for 10 days. 
Oh, sorry, you broke up there. My <laughs> womb mate <laughs> and from being born. So that also probably had quite a bit of effect, uh, you know, yeah. left behind. Uh, right. <laughs> now I laugh because uh, uh, I've traveled and journeyed into these darker corners within myself to empower and resurrect who I am as uh, this example of um, vibrant existence. And th this, is, this is why I do what I do for other people. I love empowering people to uh, come to peace uh, with who they are uh, and be the vibrant one that they are. Yeah, if I could describe what it's like in a satsang with you, I would say it's like just a nice big warm soup of of love and and um, compassion and um, you know it's been twenty years or, or so I suppose apparently yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, but uh, yeah I remember the the feeling it was very um, earthy and and. Uh, yeah, well, it's just like as I sit here with you, you're very, um, come on, you know, let's hang out, let's be kids again. That's the feeling I get. Yeah, it's be real. Be right? real. We, we, you know, yeah. we've all had these um, tough things happen uh, that have, you know, perhaps moved us away from hearing our own soul or the love of the universe uh, so we can find it again. We need to lose it because of non-duality, because the fact is we are the nothingness in nothing. And yet, huh, given the somebody. <laughs> hey, this is yeah. cool. Look who I got. <laughs> Her. <laughs> and, yeah. and it's, Some, I love uh, one of my favorite sayings is uh, somebody had to be you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And it's already obvious that we each have said yes to it because we wouldn't exist otherwise. We've right. been given the spot and the space and the place of hereness exactly as we are. And uh, so, you know, the non dual thing, there's no person here. Well, you know, even though it's vibratory uh, expression of quirks, you know, of its own self, nothingness ex expressing itself like this, uh, there is a, a reality that we can touch, taste, feel, hear, uh, get to know, uh, and fall in love with. And, yeah. and I mean falling in love, meaning we fall in with God yeah. as who we are, like that that is the same thing as falling in love, we fall in love, in and in and in more and more with the reality that we find and know ourselves. Yeah. Paper's falling down there. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to try to stay on a trajectory here. So okay. we'll, we'll move forward a bit. So uh, uh, I think you said there was a, a pretty pivotal event around the age of seven. Um, yeah. You said you had some sexual trauma that happened. Um, you were raped, apparently. Yes. Yeah, and, and I was, yeah. Yeah. Can you talk I, a bit about uh, that? Or? Someone who knew the family very well uh, was visiting um, and, uh, you know, saw that I was, you know, there was five of us by that time. The moment I did have another child and I'm the middle child and I was very quiet. So that was very, very busy. Um, as you can imagine, with five kids. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, I'm almost uh, there. <laughs> are you? I got four now. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, you're closer than me. I still yeah. just go like, how? Oh, well, yeah. I don't know how they handled that, but <laughs> amazingly, they did. You know, and uh, so I'm so grateful to them for that. And uh, uh, but this person spotted someone who you know didn't get a lot of attention, uh, and uh, not celebrated as because you know the unwanted this uh and uh took advantage of that uh to entice me to show him where he could go get changed and um so often happens to be a family member doesn't it or a close friend usually right. in those situations eh? yeah somebody yeah. that that the family themselves wouldn't just wouldn't 
It just doesn't wouldn't, occur. Wouldn't yeah. cross their mind, yeah. Yeah, wouldn't cross their mind. And and I share this that happened. It actually happened when I was 18 as well, somebody different. Um, but this the seven-year-old one, you know, there was no way I, I could know what was happening. I didn't understand it. Right, yeah. So had any way to compute. Uh, it was more actually um, a, a, a necessary. It was I was attempting to survive. It was through my mouth. And so I couldn't breathe very well. Uh, so it, it was a survival thing. Everything in me just turned to survival. I went into shock and closed down. Uh, but it, it, um, yeah. So it, 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 uh, would you say that was the next big pivotal thing that happened, uh, after birth, I guess that built upon the developing Canella story, uh, yeah. Well, you know, what, what these things do is really what we go through is how we can help other people, you know? Uh, so I support people with trauma, that kind of trauma, to take away the energy that given to perpetrators. And that's why I don't mention so much about them, like even in my book, um, it was first published as From Rape to Freedom. Uh, uh, pretty ballsy act. And I, I just try that with a smile because I, I am a woman. I know I don't have balls, but hey, it's got, you know, uh, a picture of me on the front. I can uh, until they come up with a right comparable. Uh, ooh, very nice. Yeah. <laughs> so, so like you know, it's it's uh, <clears throat> to it's also published as I was told not to tell for softer. Uh, right. Yeah. For some people who have trauma, this kind of trauma, it's it's hard to see it on a book like that. Um, it's very bold. Um, but to support them, you know, and, and as your whole channel here, these interviews, you know, it's, it's about the truth of what people have experienced and uh, in exploring each our own way of coming to freedom and acknowledgement and healing around that, that the side effect is embodying it. And the part that's so cool is when a person is exploring themselves humanly, whether it's such as myself, feeling energies coming up into the throat area and feeling like you're going to suffocate, you know, uh, then to, to trust life because everything we perceive it as, has already happened. We can't perceive it if it hasn't happened. So I knew that these energies were inside me. Because as long as the energy is going to, oh, this person did this to me, uh, if there's blame, you know, mm -hmm. that's natural. Not to say that blame is wrong, but we want yeah. that energy coming to the person, the meek shall inherit the earth. Like this is it. This is a, you know, the, the like in your story, the, the depression, you know, that these are realities of being human they're apparently not strong or good or oh you know for me to come out with this and tell people the truth you know am i dirty mm -hmm. you know it's terrible to be well, it, yeah just uh, just us talking here i can understand how that would be very healing for someone to hear someone talk about it in a very uh, matter of fact way and clearly you're coming from a place of um uh, groundedness and uh you know people can tell by watching you that you've been healed mm -hmm. healed from yeah uh you know these these experiences so um yeah mm -hmm. i i guess I'm, I'm trying to for people watching just trying to paint a picture of the path from you know it started out as canela the twin to canela the unwanted twin to you know, oh, yeah. the, you know what I mean? Just how do you feel that progressed towards uh, the next big thing? And what was that next big thing? I suppose the next big thing was attempting suicide. Suicide, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, and, right. And all what, of these, these things like having been raped, like being uh, trespassed against so deeply. I mean, that sh shot me backwards in even more into my shell to not you know, be terrified to come out, to be seen attempting to vanish was the side effect you know attempting to try to be even more aware so i wouldn't be hurt like that right mm -hmm. uh so uh 
So you said, I think in your notes, you said uh, I was around the age of 15. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. around the age of 15 that uh, I had gotten kicked out of school and uh, because I was hanging out with friends and we were just having a good time, but uh, I was enjoying that I belonged with a group of friends. It was quite uh, uh, honoring for me because I wasn't used to that. I was uh, much more alone, a loner kind of kid. And uh, so I got kicked out of school because of just not showing up. Uh, and then uh, my parents were disappointed and shared that disappointment with me and what a bad reflection I was on the family and so forth. And I already was, as I mentioned, uh, uh, mm -hmm. experiencing depression, uh, sometimes very dark about myself of being not very good and uh, not belonging. Nobody wants, you know, mm -hmm. not so healthy thoughts, you know, but true. I felt that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I thought the best thing to do was to get rid of myself. Uh, just that I would support everybody by, I would stop being such a burden on them. So I check, check out. Yeah. Yeah. So I mixed up some powder that said poison. It was a eye wash solution. I took about a quarter of a cup of the powder and filled up a mug, about three quarters of the cup, a Campbell's soup mug. <laughs> like, you know, I know everybody around the world might be listening to this. That's it. You know, uh, maybe it's a worldwide simple, but American Canadian. Uh, Campbell's has gone worldwide, hasn't it? Yeah. At any rate, it, it's an odd thing. I can see that cup. <laughs> so it's always, you know, I mixed it up and I drank it down. And uh, instantly, even now, you know, I can feel this. My body lights up with this energy that says, I want to live. I want to live. I want to live. Yeah. And I was like, oh my gosh, what have I done? What have I done? I wanted to live. You know, and I want to share this partly because people who are considering suicide, it's a pretty good chance that you might change your mind once you've done it. And so... And you don't you know, always get a second chance. You don't yeah. always get a second chance. You know, yeah. luckily I, I woke up my mother because it was in the night that I felt so dark. And so I went to, I was just... I went and woke her up and, and she helped me to put my finger down my throat because I didn't know what to do. All I kept saying to her is, I want to live, but I want to live, I want to live. And uh, I'm sure you, you saw know. a very, did you see a, a different side of your mom in that moment when you told her and you woke her up? or what? Uh, Yeah, well, strangely, she didn't quite wake up. It was almost as if she was sort of dreaming and she never remembered. <laughs> I, I talked to her later and she never, it was never spoken of. People said, you know, they wondered why I was so suddenly sick. And I didn't say anything I because I thought my mother knew and she wasn't saying anything. Yeah, so, yeah it was just dismissed. As, uh, interesting. I don't know if you've ever heard about um, the, the uh, statistics from uh, people who have jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge. I think there's been, you know, thousands of people since it opened that have jumped off it and, and, uh, you know, ended their body. Uh, but um, I did read somewhere that uh, of those thousands, there's been like 20 about or so who didn't die, who fell and lived. And, uh, and the, they apparently talk to each other, they meet up and um, what a club. <laughs> uh, Can I do it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the uh, the Golden Gate Club. That's a perfect uh, because because the commonality between them all uh, is that uh, they all agreed that they had the same exact experience, which was the moment their their hands left the rail, instant regret. Yeah. See, now this is so worthwhile to share, <laughs> and yeah. you know. Robin yeah. Williams letting go, you know, also that it doesn't have to do with how much money or how popular you are. Right. Uh, how, how you made it, you know, he, yeah. he gave a big gift in that, that uh, it's being yeah. human. We're all human. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I always feel like, you know, you can just hearing about that, you can actually be in their body as it's happening. You can feel, you can sense 
you can understand that their mind absolutely shut up in that moment. They had no story, right? It was just no, just life. Just life. Oh, it was it was I, it was really bright light that just just my whole body it just was electrified, electric, yeah. and I was like, this wow, I want to live. Yeah. I'm so, you know. Fortunately for them, you know, they had years afterwards, whereas maybe other people just had 30 seconds to enjoy. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. I feel very, I don't know, pleased with myself for having chosen a way that uh, I could find my way through. I mean, even though not that I suggest that people, <laughs> obviously. Yeah. But, there's there's uh, other ways. <laughs> there's other ways, but the first way is to talk about it. Right. You know, you're feeling blue, and, and especially now we have more support. Uh, certainly, uh, I've attempted many times to offer space for people who feel suicidal uh, for free, uh, satsang, uh, private, confidential, uh, and no one comes forward. People have come sort of and say, well, I thought about, you know, that they're afraid to say. And they feel yeah. so alone that it's such a stretch to, and it, and it's such a hardened belief usually that nobody can help, nobody yeah. could understand, you know, spe specifically my story. My story is, you know, nobody's yeah. had that. It yeah. had it like that, yeah. So, hmm. yeah. So yeah, that was a pivotal moment where, but I guess one of the best because because of that feeling of life rushing through my body with me. And then also from that moment on, no matter what happened, even if my mind came up with the idea, you know, I don't want to live anymore. This isn't worth it. I'm not, you know, I'm not good at life or whatever it is. The thoughts, it's not like the thoughts necessarily go, go away. But it, for me, it was easy to just go. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you want to live. <laughs> so I could dismiss those thoughts, you know, and not uh, not not go down with them. After that initial yeah. attempt, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, later when I had uh, difficulties, uh, and I called crisis crisis line, the person asked me if I was suicidal, and I had to say no. And and because of that, I didn't actually get emotional support. Because you'd had to be suicidal for this particular program to offer support, not just uh, go insane. It wasn't enough. Mm. Funny world, eh? Mm. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. okay, so you're 15. Uh, mm. Drank the uh, the Kool Aid and <laughs> and made it out of it. Um, and then you mentioned when you were 18, you also had another sexual trauma happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's that's quite the uh, life is, you know, firing on on all cylinders there for you to uh, to get to the bottom of something. It seems because that's quite a um, yeah. And actually, it's it's true. The eighteen year old experience uh, was not through the mouth; it was through the vagina, and so it was uh, more of what I traditionally everybody thinks of as rape. Um, but, you know, in my book, I also talk about and define rape. So it's, it's you know, any any penetration of the body. Uh, right. Yeah, so, any violation or any, what's the best word to use? Because some words are laden trespass. with yeah. trespass. Yeah. 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 So, uh, you know, and I want to say because of that word, I was raised Catholic. And, uh, you know, when that word comes up, sometimes I hear the Lord's Prayer, uh, you know, that, uh, to forgive those who trespass against us. Mm. Oh, Holy Mary, pardon me. It's a it's a Hail Mary prayer. Um, and as you can see, I have Mary. Yeah, there, there Mary, she is. Mary de Guadalupe uh, on my wall. Uh, she came just oh, such a wonderful energy there. Um, but I felt, uh, you know, because there was also when I was uh, fifteen, I had uh, partaken of a a joint that was laced with LSD. And then I was on a trip to Disneyland with my parents and uh, had a flashback. Uh, luckily, I mean, this is the short story. Uh, yeah, I was very terrified because, of course, I didn't do anything. And I found myself completely and absolutely in another a bunch of dimensions uh, that I didn't understand. 
And uh, luckily there was a doctor on the bus and my parents approached him to come speak with me. And he said to me, you're going to have to accept this. There's no cure for flashbacks. Mm. But there must have been something more than marijuana in that joint for you to have a flashback. So mm. uh, thank heavens, right? The right doctor. Um, so I used the Hail Mary prayer to focus on, to when things started to get crazy in what I was seeing and what I was experiencing inside, I would just focus on that prayer. And uh, eventually I adjusted to uh, those avenues being open uh, in me. Uh, and I didn't understand, of course, until later that uh, the drugs had just opened up uh, dimensions within myself, within my own mind, uh, that are naturally with us all. Um, but of course, it was distorted. And especially once I was afraid, that distorted it even more. Mm. Whereas in the complete openness, these are just multiple dimensions, of, you know, whatever the person's ability to see and experience in uh, life or the cosmos, you know, in this that appears here. So uh, again, that opened up uh, um, the psychic stuff uh, strongly. And so I'm clairaudient. Uh, the white clair witchy stuff. <laughs> can hear, see, feel, and, you know, everything. Uh, very extremely empathetic, empathetic in uh so far, I'm the most empathetic person I've ever met. <laughs> but uh, you can't quantify that. So <laughs> no, no, you can't. Mm. Uh, but uh, yeah, and it's it's what makes it's wonderful. I think that's was in what I wrote, sent to you that I read the Celestine prophecy and realized there are more people like me who see and feel life as energy. Mm -hmm. So uh, that felt better because you know. Yeah, so, yeah. yes, um, that came after you had children, correct? The Celestine so, uh, thing? Or? Oh, the Celestine prophecy, yes. Yeah. So, so uh, was the next big event, I guess it was having your, your boys, right? Yeah, having my boys. Da, 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 da. Talk about da, da. change your life, eh? Nobody yeah. can say what parenthood's going to be like until you're one. <laughs> and... Uh, Absolutely. That, uh, Stephen yeah. came in, you know, my first son in 1990. And uh, instantly, the first thing I knew, I just looked at his eyes and said, completely innocent. I could see that immediately. He showed me innocence. And then he showed me wholeness. There was nothing more. He didn't need to be anything more. He was already whole. He was already, he was completely innocent. So my Catholic idea of being a sinner didn't sinner, yeah. fit this. Yeah. It's like, what? And I, it just sort of lodged in me, but I, a new mom, you know, my universe had changed and here's this little being trusting me. Ah, you know, wow. And then, you know, 16 months later, boom, uh, another boy, uh, 1992, mm -hmm. uh, Danny showed up again, pure innocence, pure wholeness, and completely unique from his brother. There's, like beyond sex, mm -hmm. just complete, whole, innocent, boom, boom. And so then I was like, it just started to really cook things in me. Like what happened to me? Cause I didn't feel innocent. I didn't feel whole. I felt right. like something was wrong with me. And right. um, I certainly didn't feel unique. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe I never even looked at what, what does unique really mean? You know? Yeah. And the unique you're talking about is not, like the egoic kind of specialness that you know people seek, uh, but you're talking about just the just the, out of all possibilities, out yeah. of all possibilities, the universe picked each and every one of us to take up the space we've been given, given yeah. a mind, given a personality, a way of being, legs and arms. You know, if we have them, you know, I, I know that there are variations, but mm. but there's no halfway thing here. If you're alive. It's been given to you, and it's it's a hundred percent completely equal to every single person. We've all been given the same thing, right. uh, with different attributes to get to know, to be with, to fall in love with. Uh, mm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that that uh, created a uh, that acted as a, a catalyst for 
really just I, I, I can't think of a better uh, <laughs> expression. This is probably a little distasteful for some, but balls to the wall kind of, <laughs> yeah. right? I was just. Yeah, absolute uh, truth. They showed me the truth, right? Somehow, some way. So just I, being this. I just mean uh, that created a sense of, did that create like a sense of urgency in you to, to well, get to the bottom of things? and Well, that innocence was yeah. huge so you know brought up in kind of a regular way at the time for some of us uh you know where uh, uh punishments from parents were uh different modalities of uh, you know i don't want to say too much about all of that i understand and, uh my my parents did what they needed to do and turns out later um i was uh, in reception of a heck of a lot of anger, <laughs> if that makes sense, right? So I have learned to uh, alchemize that energy over time and now see that as, um, you know, initiation of, of energies of what, what I uh, received through them. However, I was not going to do the same thing with my children. Mm, yeah, I was faced with their innocence and I was faced with the uh, familiar family patterns right of uh how things run in families the, yeah yeah the societally my, accepted yeah. roles that were yeah to yeah. be angry and take it out towards you know if i'm angry it's their fault sort of thing mm. and uh if they were different i wouldn't be angry so they get punished you know so i couldn't bring it to them because of their innocence uh, but I felt it and I started to feel like going, like I was going to go insane. And that's really, that's what put, like, what did you say? The balls against the wall? <laughs> if I had them, <laughs> if I had them, <laughs> that was it. Because I was not going to, I started asking everybody, please help me. I, I don't want to hurt my children. Please help me. I need help. Somebody help me. And that's when I phoned the crisis line and he told me about ACOA, adult uh, children of alcoholics, a group. Mm. Uh, and because there was alcoholism in, in my family of origin as well. Mm. And uh, it was there that somebody told me about a workshop where I could, you know, unpack some of this stuff and learn how to, uh, at their way was to, you know, manage to be with it, to, uh, to not, you know, to, to learn how to manage it, to balance uh, with that within myself. Um, and then, yeah, I've taken it even further into, uh, satsang into actually using that healing as a modality to bring precision precision of the person in their awareness with themselves in each moment and point out see how present you are in the midst of it you cannot not be present and be with your stuff inside it's impossible mm. amen so, yeah. amen amen so it's like you know you're inviting me to an interview here is like yes because the human aspect is an avenue of non-duality. Mm. Non-duality is not dual. So this right. so idea, must include it. Yeah. yes, this idea as the absolute, the nothingness in which we are, and as expressed, is also there's no separation between us as humans and us as air and us as the floor and you know that however it is existence is showing up like this yeah. and it's incredible one movement which we all are a part of and uh, so of course a way to that is to be with ourselves within to uh, embrace whatever there is there to embrace mm -hmm. yeah so the um mm. Mm. <laughs> uh, sometimes i draw blanks but uh yeah, the uh, the the birth prompted the um, intensification of the search, I suppose, for wholeness. And uh, I'm just going off the notes you gave me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was more. It was more the not wanting to hurt my children. Oh, okay. uh, and then that that prompted the you know a definite you know I need to work on myself uh, and. Uh, so how, what did, how did that show up? Like, what did it look like? Uh, how did it unfold? Well, I started taking workshops at this place that was recommended. Um, 
the, the haven by the sea on Gabriel Island, Island. And I approached my parents and said, I need support because, you know, we were a one income family for me to go to workshops and stuff cost, cost money. Uh, and I said, this is for your grandsons. Uh, and they gave me some money so I could use that. I made it last two years. Uh, it was $2,000. So, um, and then it was through that place that people, all my favorite workshop leaders were starting to, the ones that I felt really supported me in many, many, many ways, uh, they started disappearing. And I was like noticing, well, where, where, are they, where are they going? And they said they're going to be with this fellow, Paul Lowe. So I didn't know that anything about Osho. I didn't know anything about waking up. I didn't know that we could be but there's Right, yeah. So, but I was in my healing, my sincerity of, of bringing harmony to myself in all these various ways and, and finding all sorts of wonderful side effects of, you know, starting to practice Reiki and, and all this and uh, finding myself in it. The strength of, of being this empathetic was a gift, not a bad thing. Like when I, after I read the, you know, the Celts and Prophecy and stuff, I, I went walking with my dad and uh, I told him how I experienced life because I'd never, all I knew was that I was totally different, but I didn't point to myself and say, this is this, you know, until I read it outside of myself, I didn't, it was just part of me. So I, I didn't, I didn't know that all I knew is I was seeing things differently because whatever I said, what I saw, it didn't fit. Everybody else was like, Oh, don't be ridiculous or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, or quit being so sensitive. Um, mm. So I was telling him how I experienced life, and he actually said, "Well, can we fix you? <laughs> can we get you into a hospital? You know, and can they fix this?" He goes, "I would hate to live like that." Mm. And yeah, it is hard. And I want to say that to people when they're sensitive and they're feeling things inside themselves, and they don't want to be. Uh, and when they're when they're not, uh, that's a perfectly valid response to uh, i remember uh there was some colorful things that happened in my family um and i brought up the topic of emotions with my dad on the phone one time and um and, and feelings you know that they weren't typically expressed very much at all growing up and uh you know he just flat out said well i'm not you know i'm not ready for that i'm not you know and uh you know, it really is too much for, exactly. you know, yeah. for people that are not, for whatever yeah. reason, ready for it. So, yeah. Later, yeah. you know, I, I offered, I was, uh, you know, prior to COVID and after I separated from my last husband, uh, uh, I said, well, dad, I could come and stay with him uh, for, you know, about four months uh, if he wanted me to. Um, he was having some difficulties and had, uh, you know, he was fine overall. He was still living on his own. Um, and he said, no, I don't think that would work because you live life on the inside and I live life on the outside. Mm. <laughs> and I, no, very, I thought it was, it was an honoring that he saw me, you know, right. yeah. uh, like I didn't talk about those things uh, with him. I don't think too much. Maybe I did. <laughs> yeah, I must have. Right? <laughs> And for him to recognize himself in that, there was nothing wrong with that. He, uh, you know, uh, there's no way that we can be other than we are. Mm -hmm. And whatever that tr truth is, you know, it's right for each person. What's right. Like your dad, you know, that he said, I'm not ready for that. That's great. If he can mm -hmm. say that. Mm -hmm. Did he ever change or want to talk about it more? Oh, sorry. I thought you were reflecting on your own dad there. No, 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 no. Your dad, because you said that he uh, wasn't ready for sharing about feelings <clears throat> and emotions. Did he ever come around to uh, wanting to share more of how he felt about things? No, it's... Uh, not yet? <laughs> not yet. Yeah. Okay. Likely, if I had to guess, likely not in this lifetime. So, um, but who knows? Yeah. Uh, who knows? You know? Um, 
Yeah, and that's okay. Uh, I've definitely uh, come to an acceptance of the family yeah. situation, and you know, uh, obviously, holding anything against them just keeps you in some kind of victim identity. So exactly, yeah, uh, yeah, that's not fun. So none of that. Yeah, none of that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so I, I think you mentioned uh your sister-in-law is that right brought you into reiki or something my cousin and, yeah yeah oh, my cousin. cousin earlier after that she was the one that lent me to celestine prophecy and then later uh and and this is actually written in my book uh uh i was told not to tell the story of that because that um first experience i didn't know she was taking training to be a re reflexologist where they massage your feet at pressure points or acupressure acupuncture points uh, on your feet um and she needed people to practice on <laughs> i was up for that okay mm -hmm. uh, so uh, i did and at the end of the session she massaged my aura and it felt so good that i just said oh whatever you're doing keep doing that and you know, to this day, I still always, you know, why did she, she, because right away she said, oh, I'll go wash my hands and I'll give you some Reiki, which meant she stopped exactly what I was wanting her to keep on doing. <laughs> but anyway, it ended up working out. Um, so she came back and put a hand on my chest and my forehead. And uh, I said, but you're not doing anything. She goes, just listen, listen inside. So uh, out of that experience, uh, it led one thing led to another. And there was a full Kundalini awakening. And that really changed my life to one of um, not being afraid. Uh, for me, it showed up as pure white light uh, everywhere. And there's no mistaking that there's, no, there's just no mistaking. That it's impossible for that to not have been some power that's way bigger than us. It, it just was. So would, would you describe that as the enlightenment experience or was there another type of event or situation I mean, that would literally be enlightened because <laughs> i was enlightened all right but i didn't understand yet about right. awakenness or the stateless state of being mm. uh, so that came through noticing that these people were leaving this workshop uh, place and following this guy named paul Lowe, and so i decided to go and see what this guy he came to vancouver i went to his talk and I felt my heart really beating loudly, but I, I didn't feel anything. But I bought his book, and uh, in his book, it said, wake, wake up, the experiment is over. And uh, so I, I didn't, you know, this is me learning about this waking up thing that I thought was just for Jesus or Buddha, right? Which is what your, your channel is about. It's not just for people like Jesus and Buddha. It's for all of us. Right. And it's so much more available because we're so much more refined and evolved now we all are even if it doesn't look that way with all this conspiracy stuff going on it's showing up the dark showing up because the light's so light and uh so it's it's wonderful uh we're in this so and together i'm not i'm not too familiar with paul Lowe's teachings but uh did you say he was a student of osho is that right yeah, he was. He became what they say is Osho's right hand man. He he gave sannyas. He ran workshops. He, uh, um, yeah, uh, and the excellent learning. But I didn't know what a master was or anything like that. I didn't think of him as some. You know, I didn't even really know what a guru was supposed to be. I didn't know that there was such a thing as following a guru. I just knew there's all these people I really like, and they're finding something there. I got curious. And so, you know, it was two years later after buying a book and stuff that I then uh, went to a, a workshop and weekend workshop in Calgary. And then I uh, went to some more down in California. And uh, one day he said, uh, you know, by this time now I'm okay. Because when I looked at that book and it said, the experiment is over, wake up. I said to myself, okay, wake up. And I don't know how i knew but i knew that wasn't it i knew that i hadn't woken up that there was something else that needed to happen and i didn't understand it really but that wasn't it and that's what started me on the conscious journey of 
whatever this waking up thing is. Uh, and so then, yeah, when I heard Paulo uh, say in a group in, uh, it was in Harbin Hot Springs in California, uh, he said, uh, you must let go of your life. You must let go of your world. To find this, you must let go of the world. And I knew in that moment that I had, like even now again, I feel like there's goosebumps all over my body. And uh, I knew I needed to do that. And I stood up in the group and I said, I must let, I, I let go of my world right now. Yeah, and I, I was going to walk out of the room right then with nothing except for the clothes on my back and see what happened, you know? And he was like, whoa, 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 slow down. <laughs> but I definitely knew. He said, you can do this, you know, yes. And, you know, you can do it uh, more gently and more, you know. Uh, and so then I did. That was part of the write-up, I think. I. Yeah. Uh, you said you, you yeah. even went as far as making arrangements with your boys. And is that yeah. a part of that? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We uh, made agreement with their father to, that he uh, be there uh, sole caregiver for six months because I had no idea you know all I knew was I needed to give myself a stretch of time and then uh, we would renegotiate whatever we needed to at that point at the six month period if I needed more time he knew too my my first husband uh, both of us knew I had to let go of something and go like he even used to say why don't you just go to a cave in the Himalaya or something and just find whatever it is you're looking for and uh, but I knew that wasn't it for me. It was, I didn't really understand what that meant or letting go of my world, but. And you didn't know that you, for practical purposes said six months, but I'm guessing you likely knew it, it could go on indefinitely, possibly. I pictured 30 years, but you know, because that's what I, at that point had read a few books on meditation and stuff. And that this is something that you, it's not a quick thing. Uh, Seems to not be, yeah. Especially I was fresh. I didn't really know anything much about it. Uh, so I, yeah, I thought 30 years is what, what I thought at the time. But I didn't know. I knew at first I needed to just let go of my world and see what happened because that, that the call was just, I had to, I had to. And I knew, I saw that I was using uh, my husband and my children as an excuse not to do what I needed to do. I saw it as a ball and chain that I was using. I was using them and that was wrong. Mm. So I had to do the right thing. And uh, that was hard. Mm. It was like I was leaving my own heart mm. with all three of them, you know. Mm. Uh, but I, I uh, but that's, the, that's what the Paul Lowe part, it wasn't Paul Lowe. It was, it was the group of people that he had attracted to. It was the, you know, so I went to live in a house. There was five of us that all had committed to making consciousness a first priority. And that's where I processed uh, the renunciation of my life uh, pretty much sort of as an inward thing, because uh, I don't know that other people really understood. None of them had left their children or anything like that. Uh, I became very quiet. Uh, and then this satsang thing came around. And people said, uh, they're going to go to this thing called satsang. I'm like, what's that? They couldn't tell me what it was. And so I just kind of gave up whatever it was. I wasn't getting it. So I said, oh, I'll have to just go and experience it. Count me in. I'd love to go when you guys go. You know, and then even then I didn't know. I thought satsang was just this fellow Isaac Shapiro offered this. And it was a one of w workshop thing. No idea that it had been something that had been happening for forever i was literally picked up and taken and on the first evening of a week-long retreat uh one person asked a question and then i did i asked is it beyond perception he said yes that was it and it's been that way since and that was in 1998 uh was that australia or yes yeah okay mm. yeah Molenbimbi. And so I think uh, how would you describe obviously we don't need to talk in the past tense around this. Um around any of it is yeah. really not past tense in a sense, you know. It it, it yeah, maybe there was different uh, uh but it's all right here, as it is with everybody, you know. 
And the more it's open to, the more you see, the more you gain of your whole life. Um, so the, uh, is it beyond perception moment? Um, how, how would you describe it for, you know, those listening? uh experientially like mm -hmm. what was that moment like for you well it's actually interesting i was about to say perceptually but yeah uh, yeah yeah well awareness awareness and uh perception uh the humanness you know everything is uh is awareness at play uh so awareness therefore is surrounding in and part of it all because to say it's bigger doesn't work that then makes a, something small and something big. And that's mm. where this idea that the human aspect is not the big self and, and this sort of right, yeah. didn't say it in that way. <laughs> but, All good. Uh, yeah. Uh, there's no big and little self. There's self and it includes all of it. It includes exactly what you did, rubbing your nose, the itch, the finger, uh, you know, the breath going through. Uh, my words, sounds that come out of my mouth in some sort of shape that we can understand. It's mm. like all of it. All of it is awareness at play. And we get to perceive it. Yeah, that's Perception the, uh, here. what's yeah. the word? Divine dichotomy or contradiction, or I'm not sure what the wor right word is, but yeah, it's beyond perception. And yet when that really clicks, perception changes and, and, uh, yeah. yeah yeah the stateless state shows itself and mm -hmm. is known it knows itself and uh you're part of that but it's not yeah yeah very tricky this is the hardest part of the interviews i suppose is talking about trying to put words to this well it's interesting because recently just uh a week and a half ago uh someone uh, that was in a satsang immersion with myself, um, found a particular structure within himself. And so it made it actually quite easy to say, but you're seeing the structure. So what is that, you know? And you've seen that in satsang, but he saw it as an actual uh, structure inside himself that he had grown beyond to be able to see it. Mm. So it's like that like that and so he found or it found him and uh and that was that for him uh so you know it, it's it's whatever is held on to and it's not like the held on to part is going to disappear but it does disappear in another way as you know but whatever's being held on to, that there's something about that holding in each person. For him, it was whatever it was. For me, it was, uh, you know, perception because it kept growing. I kept getting more mystical, more, you know, multidimensional, more psych, you know, all of that stuff, the cosmos. It, but I saw that it was just kept expanding. It wasn't ending and I could see it wasn't going to end. Mm -hmm. So what the heck? Yeah. going down that journey to refine myself you know but that refining did lighten up the system of awareness this system at play so that when the moment came it could just you know uh, fall open to itself mm. so yeah. uh, and so you came back from australia and um you paid a visit again to your husband or was it your ex-husband husband at the time or uh we had separated um okay. and but, your kids uh, and the kids yeah uh um, so yeah i mean of course i was like now what i, I wasn't expecting this <laughs> at all you know and uh but follow your heart so okay where are those where are those looks short dudes you know at the time, they're taller mm. than me now, of course. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I uh, went to um, Shelburne Falls, where they had gone with their father. I was waiting for them to get there because he had taken them down to Mexico. In this, this was only after three months. 
so I needed mm-hmm. to wait for him to uh, three months that I got to be re- reunited with him. Three months, Only, not not thirty years. No, from I yeah. left J- Canada January sixth, and this realizedness happened uh, on February twenty uh, first. I love how so, that illustrates um, how things tend to unfold when the yearning is there. The, the thirst for truth and freedom, you know, crystallizes. It really doesn't need to take a lot of time, you know. Yeah, and uh, also it's like there's all these books about levels of awakeness, levels of enlightenment, and you can reach this level and that level. And, you know, I, I understand that most of them, in my opinion, that I've seen are the person's process themselves. Like we're pointing to these different things that happened with, myself and i can look back and see them as playing bigger parts shall we say um but uh it doesn't come into account past lives and all that could be there so right you know it 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 doesn't mean that there's uh, the 30 years unless it does it doesn't mean there needs to be a letting go unless it does Right. right and that each person's they're the ones that know. Mm. Yeah. 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 I remember uh, back in the day when I was doing the satsang and that little place, I'd have some older people come and actually share their frustration because I was 20, early 20s at the time. And, yeah, you know, I was talking about the awakening and, and, you know, they're like, been meditating for 40 years and it's like what, what's so special about you that you you know and, yeah uh, but it really just comes down to readiness and and i'm sure there's a bit of the uh past life stuff in there that contributes to that and a lot of unseen things but it really doesn't matter ultimately <laughs> yeah no it, it doesn't uh but making it a priority matters right? Uh, making it, and so, you know, yeah. uh, making it uh, more important, you know, whatever people see as their excuses, like that I'll do this, or I can't do it because of the, I don't have enough money, or, you know, like I didn't, when I stood up in that room, I didn't, right? And then people, I didn't have money to whatever. I, I of course, thought I was going to just walk out on the road and see what happened, you know? And it's funny, I was injured at the time as well, so I would have had to take a crutch with me uh, to walk. Um, but people came instantly forward to give me money, which was really surprising to help me on my journey because they felt something and, uh, and they couldn't do it in their lives, whatever, but they wanted to participate in this somehow. Mm. And, uh, the way will come, you know, the way will come. Mm. It's like, so, so as you see, right, in your life, I'm sure, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, there's very few, what I would describe, romantic type (laughs) experiences with life that happen um, in, in that happen as intimately as, as that, as that call, when you first hear that call, and, uh, um mm-hmm. yeah um yeah. uh and and yeah maybe my silence is enough of a description there <laughs> yeah yeah the stillness and the silence and the felt feltness <clears throat> of the intimacy that you spoke of yeah. pointing to it and feeling it you know, and then that's that's how I live now is is looking for direction from that as well as my own uh, joy and fun and love and what 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 shows up as a priority for me and to include myself in that joy uh, because for the longest time I was in service, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So and, uh, you so, yeah you've been. Uh... Don't want to take up too much of your time here, but uh, <laughs> time, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So you've now been teaching in a very 
traditional way. I don't know if that's the best word, but uh, in a structured way, you've been sharing with others for about 20 years now. Is that right? Or 25 years. Yeah. 25 years. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah offering uh, satsang, satsang coaching, life coaching, uh, completely inclusive of business and uh, personal stuff. But mostly, you know, my love is empowering people, em- empowering people and supporting them to feel how loved they are by life. Mm-hmm. That, that there's to, uh, and the deeper and the darker stuff, the more I think uh, love is available, you know, because it makes it so clear. Yeah. So, um, hmm. Oh yeah, I did write down a question here. Uh, do you feel that becoming a, a spiritual teacher uh, in this way was just something that kind of evolved on its own, or did it seem like there was a, you know, a moment where I was like, you know what, I think I'm supposed to do this? And, and but when it, you know, I went to that little town, in Shelburne Falls, I was, you know, definitely now what, and so I didn't know much about you know, what do I do here? So I thought, okay, well, I better look at other awakened people to see what they do, you know? Right. And so I just put uh, a search in the little Shelburne Falls library for Ramana Maharshi. And I got all sorts of books. I got the gospel according to Ramakrishna. I got all sorts of books, you know, uh, Suzanne Segal, uh book, uh, Bernadette Roberts, maybe, uh, None. Uh, anyway, uh, I got all these different books, and each one I would read, I loved it, and then it was like, that's not me, that's not me. And you know, then I realized, whatever, you know, just follow my heart. And I already, you know, practiced Reiki, but at the time I, I couldn't work legally in the States. I was be, living there um, to be close to my children, and uh, they were the priority. So, so um, you're the way that I, you shared I, kind yeah. of a. Sorry, kind Sorry, of evolved. <laughs> well, yeah, the, the, what happened was somebody from the Paulo group, uh, Brahm, uh, Will Foster, he, uh, he he had a son and his parents lived in a town close by. So we would meet for lunch when he came over out that way. He'd lived in Arizona. So he'd fly out with his son to visit with his son's grandparents. And uh, we'd go for lunch and talk. And uh, he had been uh, you know, very close with Osho. Um and we were talking on the phone one day <clears throat> and he, he said something about coming out of the closet on something. Uh, you know, he's a very, very intelligent man. And uh, so maybe about his gifts or I can't even remember what that was because then I just laughed and said, Oh, me too. I'll come out of the closet too. But I, I didn't know about what yet. I just said that because it was just sounded like fun, you know? And he said, great. I'll organize a sad sign for you. And so he so flew me from Massachusetts to uh, to Tucson, Arizona, and arranged uh, a satsang weekend for people to come, and people came, and that's how it started. And so I go by invitation, and people keep. I've I've just recently been invited to give uh, satsang in China. Oh, cool! Uh, so I'm really looking forward to that, and things are moving along well. So, uh, and I was in Calgary recently, and. Uh, I'll be moving to Croatia, so I'll be available, very available in Europe, wow. newly for yeah, any invitations there. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah I. Uh, well, I know anybody that uh, uh, takes you up on your offer uh, are going to be in for a treat. So mm-hmm. lucky us to have you yeah, in the world yeah. at the moment. Yeah. Uh, no, thank you, Kyle. Thank you. And of course, people could, you know, my book is. On Kindle, you know, the ebook, it's super inexpensive. People can help themselves with that. Yeah. Uh, if they like the sound of this way. Yeah. So being. the uh, the best way to get a hold of you is primarily through your website or just yeah, a quick. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, and on Amazon, Google, Canela Michelle. Canela Michelle. Uh, Canela means cinnamon in Spanish. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've never heard of another Canela Michelle up until now. So you'll find me for sure. And, I think there's uh, another Kyle who been, I think he's a baseball player or something. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So, uh, yeah, it's good. It's good. And uh, you know what I like too about uh, interviews is that it always brings another aspect out. But, but in the particular, you know, this, you know, you've, you've really, in my heart of hearts, you know, I, I, uh, people don't need to suffer. Or, you know, they do need to suffer until they realize that they don't have to suffer right. and that they hold the key. And I love supporting people to uh, give themselves freedom from, uh, you know, even taking on too much responsibility or uh, just all sorts of regular human things that right. end up being big things because we're in this together mm -hmm. you know we're so in this together and one person each person opening up to the reality the truth makes it easier for all the rest of humanity for the collective so um yeah yeah good so, stuff yeah so thank you for including the human aspect so deeply because mm -hmm. it is yeah and, and thank you for uh being willing to meet with me I've enjoyed our mm -hmm. chat and, and I hope we can do it again sometime. Absolutely. And where are you, by the way? Uh, right now I'm about a half hour outside of Edmonton. Oh, okay. Okay. So yeah. I, I was just in Calgary and I realized after, when went, were you there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, all righty. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, uh, thank you, Canella. I really appreciate you Gosh. popping by and, yeah. Um, yeah, if anybody wants to find you, check out canellamichelle.com and or a quick Google search, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. And thank you, Kyle. Yeah. For, thank uh, you. And big blessings to your new channel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to you and whatever direction the wind is blowing you. To Croatia. Yeah. Yes. That's right. Love, love calls. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll bet. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. I will, uh, I'll talk to you soon then. Great. Bye.